demands a certain attention and is not easily dismissed. But there is something deeply unsettling about a work that uncritically espouses brutality as a function of alienation and nonconformity. Hotline Miami, made by Denaton Games, released in 2012. A pixelated top-down shooter that seemingly wore its heart on its sleeve. This was a glamorous and violent experience, with tons of weapons to unlock, new modifiers to use as you progress in the form of masks, and even a combo counter to encourage a visceral and fast playstyle. That's where it stops, right? There's nothing of substance to be found here, nothing to say, no point to make, only an arcadey shooter made by some indie developers that we'd look back on as just a drop in the bucket. No. Hotline Miami is much more than that. There's a story here, not just in this game, but across the franchise, in sequels and fan games, in the online discourse that surrounds it. There's something worth talking about, something to learn from. But why would we care in the first place? The gameplay itself needs to act as that anchor point, to bring fans in, to give people something to engage with, and to do so in a way that drives home the themes present in the narrative. Hotline Miami is structured like this. You get your opening to each level, a bit of story in the form of the voicemails that the main character, Jacket, receives, as well as some visual storytelling that I'll touch on later as well, followed by the player going downstairs to their car, heading out to the level itself, and when you reach the level, you step out of the car, put on the mask of your choosing, and are let loose. And I phrased it that way for a reason. Let loose. Like a rabid animal. Once the level starts, once you're let loose, there is no stopping you until you've eviscerated everything on screen with a pulse or you yourself are put down. There are dozens of weapons to choose from, with firearms that all serve their own purpose depending on the range and type of enemy you're facing. If you're in close proximity or fighting one of the heavies, use a shotgun. Trying to shoot enemies that are further away, use a pistol for some quick and accurate shots down range or spray and pray with an assault rifle. All it takes is one shot from the right weapon to kill someone, but the same can be said for you. It keeps the playing field level, but this isn't a tactical shooter. The gameplay needs to be fast paced, and so you can't reload any weapons. Once you're out of ammo, the only thing you can do is toss your weapon and find a new one. Maybe you throw your gun to knock down an enemy and take theirs, or you find one of the myriad of melee weapons placed throughout the levels. These all have their own properties, between blunt and sharp weapons, as well as sporting their own unique attack animations on both upright and downed enemies. Nothing in the gameplay is cookie cutter, so to speak. Everything feels handcrafted to near perfection. Will there be times that you're caught by an enemy off screen? Yeah, of course, but that teaches you to use the gameplay mechanics at your disposal and zoom further across the map to scope things out before engaging, as well as using the lock-on functionality to increase the likelihood that your shots will land. This could be a problem if it took ages to retry a level upon dying, but with one press of the R key, you're able to respawn in just about a second. Between the speed of the gameplay itself, how quickly you can retry after dying, and the songs that back each level, players are kept going at lightning speed, with play sessions becoming a cacophony of sights and sounds that border on sensory overload, to the point where you almost forget that you're actually playing as a masked vigilante going on a killing spree. As a player, we become addicted to the rush of the gameplay, seeing that multiplier climb higher and higher, encouraged to keep going by the ever-present music and the thought of just one more try that precedes every respawn. So as a developer, how do you take that experience from the gameplay and use it to your advantage? How do you drive home the point you wanted to make? You cut the track. You bring the lights up. You make the players look at what they've done. At the end of every level, you're forced to walk back through the map and acknowledge the carnage you've not only caused, but had fun engaging in. When the music dies down, all that's left are the corpses. And it's in these slower paced walks back through the level, at least compared to the main gameplay, that we can see the visual storytelling I alluded to earlier. Jacket is forced to reckon with the things he's done, and we see this wear on him further and further as we progress. From the first level, where the violence he's caused results in a physical reaction, puking in the alleyway as the mission closes out, we can tell this isn't something he necessarily wants to do. But forcing players to walk back through each level is meant to elicit a similar reaction and ask us a very important question. But I'm getting ahead of myself, I'll get to that question in just a minute. Other fantastic examples of the visual storytelling can be found in the relationship between Jacket and his girlfriend. When they first meet, he's saving her from the Russian Mafia. In dialogue, she expresses to him that she fully expected him to kill her too, but instead he carries her out to his car and back to his apartment. 
Over the course of the game, we see their relationship grow, visually represented by changes in the apartment, like how early on they're sleeping in separate beds and later the beds are pushed together, or how the apartment gradually gets cleaner and decorations such as flowers start showing up. Their relationship even acts as a driving force in one of the best levels in the game, the police station. In all of this madness, she's been the one person supporting him. She's the closest thing he has to some semblance of a normal life. Enter Richter, another person who was sent a mask and is receiving these cryptic and threatening voicemails, who kills her and puts Jacket in the hospital. Now Jacket has nothing left to lose. Upon waking up from his coma and escaping the hospital, he heads for the police station, walks through the front door, and pulls the trigger until every blue uniform is a deep crimson red. To go to such lengths as to face down what is essentially an army, all to get to the man that killed his girlfriend. If nothing else, this level does a fantastic job at showing us just how much she meant to Jacket. There are other levels across the series that effectively use the narrative as the main motivator for completion rather than just relying on the rock-solid gameplay, but this is by far my favorite one, at least from the first game. Now, to pivot into that narrative as it's written, not just visually represented, by getting into that question that the game likes to ask the player oh so often. Do you like hurting other people? It's a question that permeates the entire series, both in terms of the story itself as well as how people reacted to the games upon release. Nearly as many bodies litter the halls of the levels as they do Jacket's own mind. As we find out, he's a war veteran, having served in Hawaii a short time ago. Between his experiences in the war and the massacres that take place in the game, things are taking a toll on him. It starts slow, his hallucinations. So slow, in fact, you won't even know they're happening on a first playthrough. In a really clever twist, it's revealed that the man who works at all of the different stores Jacket visits at the end of levels, Beard, from the pizza shop to the video rental place to the convenience store, he was never actually working there. In fact, he's not even alive. Beard served with Jacket in Hawaii, having died in a nuclear bomb attack, and Jacket is now the only one left of the pair. Then there's the smaller instances of Jacket hallucinating, multiple conversations with his victims appearing as mutilated as they were when he left them to bleed out in previous missions. Lastly, you have the three masked people in his own psyche, Rasmus the Owl, Richard the Rooster, and Don Juan the Horse. This is where we're first asked that question, do you like hurting other people? It's clear that Jacket doesn't like hurting other people. He does what he does out of necessity, and once he's achieved his goal, he has nothing left to do. There's nothing left to say. Yes, the main thing on display in the first game was the gameplay. The story took a back seat, and I think that's part of the reason that many fans missed the point. But the story that is there is great. It hooked me from the moment Jacket received his first phone call and kept me coming back for each and every one of the subsequent missions. It gave me a reason to replay old levels and unlock the secret ending, and it showed me that this franchise has something to say. Hotline Miami is one of, if not the, most brutally violent anti-war statements ever made. It's a game whose thesis statement is written in the blood you spill while playing and the sequel had no intention of letting that story fall to the wayside. Just when it's supposedly getting to grips with its theme, it goes utterly haywire and becomes yet another brainless, humorless bone cruncher. Fans clamored for more Hotline Miami, so Denaton made the sequel about them. But before I get into the story, I want to address the multitude of improvements that were made to the gameplay and overall player experience. Across the board, there were changes made, some big and some small, but all were in service of a much better game for the players. There are more weapons to choose from than ever before, and sprites for characters are more detailed with improvements to animations as well. Not only that, but the soundtrack is unbelievable. I'll speak to that more in a little bit, but just know that the music in this game will leave an impact on you. The mask choosing system from the first game is mostly gone, barring some levels with characters I'll get to shortly. And while I originally lamented the loss of it, I don't anymore. Forcing players into being one character for a level allows for much tighter design. As a developer, you no longer have to account for how players will interact with this level using all of the different masks. You can focus on giving them access to one character with one skill set and create the best possible level based around that. Does it remove some player agency? Sure, but the trade-off being a much more cohesive and enjoyable gameplay experience is worth it to me. 
For the sake of argument, let's say it's not worth it to you, though. What's the solution, then? How about the full-blown level editor that Denaton included, allowing the community to create and publish not just maps, but entire campaigns as well, all with custom characters, weapons, and songs. This gave fans the ability to ostensibly play Hotline Miami 2 the way they wanted to play it indefinitely. And at the risk of sounding like that one Hotline Miami meme of the house floor plan that just says, this game plays fire, you should totally go try out some of these custom maps and campaigns. There really is a lot of well-designed, high-quality work out there. Even with all the aforementioned gameplay improvements, the story and themes of Hotline Miami 2 took center stage this time around. With Jacket incarcerated for his actions in the first game and the mysterious voicemail seemingly disappearing overnight, it's been several years since we last saw masked maniacs in Miami. Denaton could have chosen to rehash much of the same story, continuing with another character who keeps receiving the same voicemails that Jacket did, but they went a different route. There are a ton of incredibly well-written characters in the game, but I want to focus on just a few of them here. First up is Martin Brown, otherwise known as the Pig Butcher. His first appearance within the series is actually in a trailer for the first game, titled Wear Something Fancy. If you watch that trailer, you'll see it's presented like a trailer for a movie, and in Hotline Miami 2, we actually see him starring in that movie. I just thought that was a really cool detail to see that idea get fully implemented like that. This movie, Midnight Animal, not to be confused with the game Midnight Animal that we'll talk about in a later section of the video, is an in-universe movie adaptation of the events of the first game. And like many movie adaptations, they are made by people who sorely misunderstood the source material. Jacket is the anti-hero in the first game, and now the Pig Butcher is a crazed murderer in this movie. Where Jacket saves a girl from the Russian Mafia and slowly forms a relationship with her over the course of the game, the movie depicts an obsessive aggressor. It goes so far as to include a scene in the movie where the Pig Butcher assaults the character that represents Jacket's girlfriend. Thankfully, the directors of the film do cut before anything actually happens. This is a movie, after all. And before starting the game, players are warned of this scene and given the option to skip it, which is greatly appreciated. Some could say that the inclusion of this scene is gratuitous, and I'm certainly not advocating for further depiction of these actions in media, but it's used effectively as a tool here. It illustrates that the movie creator's understanding of the events of the first game is terribly distorted. Later in the game, there are even some scenes of Martin proclaiming that working on the movie has allowed him to live out his violent fantasies, justifying that it's fine because he's not actually committing those acts. It's all fake. It's all a movie. Similar to how anyone who thought the point of the first title was exclusively the violence would say, it's just a game, a means to live out that fantasy and nothing more. Framing the narrative of the first game as a poorly adapted movie and putting players who misunderstood the first game in the highly exaggerated character of Martin Brown could not have been a more clear message from the developers. And yet they knew there would still be fans who'd miss the memo. So to double down on this idea, Denaton introduced a group of new masked vigilantes for Hotline Miami 2, dubbed quite literally as The Fans. A little bit of world building is needed to properly explain this next section, so just bear with me. In the world of Hotline Miami, there was a war between America and Russia in the 1980s that resulted in a nuclear attack on American soil. This led to the creation of the Russo-American Coalition, or the RAC. This is an alliance between the US and Soviet Union that keeps open lines of communication between political figures from both nations so as to avoid an all-out nuclear war. In America, there is a nationalist group formed called 50 Blessings that wants to break apart this coalition. They're the ones delivering animal masks to people and making threatening phone calls. They're sending people on assassination missions, targeting people in the Russian Mafia as well as high-ranking members of the RAC. After the events of the first game, 50 Blessings discontinues the use of the phone calls. When we catch up with the fans at the start of Hotline Miami 2, these are the exact calls that they are eagerly waiting to receive. But why do they want these calls? Well, the fans are another group of veterans who served in Hawaii, in a different company than Jacket and Beard. They idolize Jacket due to the events of the first game, but unlike him and many other unwilling participants of this scheme, they desperately want to garner the attention of 50 Blessings and go on missions for them. They end up making their own missions, between requests from friends, catching wind of local gang hideouts, or even hunting down members of the near-crippled Russian Mafia. It's on these missions that they commit several gruesome acts of violence. One of these is on a member of the Russian Mafia, who is actually a playable character in the game, but in this scene he's completely defenseless, strung out on drugs. 
Without any real sense of purpose, it's clear that the fans are just doing this for the sake of reliving their glory days in Hawaii. For a misplaced sense of justice fueled by their adoration of Jacket and an extremist hatred for Russia. For the sake of killing. The fans have a playstyle that is closest to the one present in the original game, albeit with slightly tweaked abilities. While you can pick which of the fans you get to play as for the bulk of their levels, it's with the caveat that there's only a handful of members in the group, resulting in far fewer masks, quote unquote, to choose from. Though I still believe this reduction allowed the developers to create better designed levels overall. Denaton have even gone on record stating that the fans are meant to symbolize the players who wanted Hotline Miami 2 to be the exact same as the first game. However, it's specifically due to the changes made moving into the sequel that allowed it to both expand the world further and explore the characters that we already knew more in depth. This is how we were given the backstory of Beard, Jacket's friend from the first game. Both of them were members of a military task force in the Soviet-American war, and many of these missions involve Beard taking back bases or other installations. The best of these can be seen in the level Casualties, where Beard and his group's objective is clearing out a power station. Starting out with larger open areas in the outskirts of the station and moving into tighter, more enclosed buildings gives the combat a fantastic variety in this level, especially with a decent mix of enemy types present. The backing track to this level is The Way Home by Magic Sword, and while a great song in its own right, it was the perfect choice for this level thematically. This is the task force's last mission before their tour is over, and so the path they bloody on the way through the power station is literally and figuratively the way home. This highlights Hotline Miami 2's ability to effectively mix narrative and soundtrack to motivate the player beyond the intrinsic desire to get a high score. As they reach their objective, the plant is sent into a meltdown and things begin to crumble around them. In their attempt to escape, Jacket is gravely injured, forcing Beard to carry him out of the station and back to safety. He's able to successfully call emergency evac for Jacket, and in this interaction he also gives Jacket a Polaroid of the two of them. The very same one we saw Jacket with at the end of the first game. Flash forward briefly and we see Beard working at a convenience store. For real this time. He's on the phone with Jacket, consoling his friend over his recent breakup, and after the two hang up, Beard is drawn outside by some commotion. He steps outside to see what's going on, and a blinding flash of light fills the screen. Russia just detonated a nuclear bomb in San Francisco, the one that led to the creation of the RAC and 50 Blessings. It all makes sense now, why in the first game Jacket was so adept at combat, why he kept hallucinating Beard working in those shops, why he was not only willing to listen to the voicemails he was sent by 50 Blessings, but acted on them almost ferociously. Beard's words echo in his mind. No need to thank me, kid. It's on the house. You would have done the same for me, right? And he did just that. As our story comes to a close, we see another Russian bomb go off, wiping Miami off the map and the entire cast of characters along with it. This was Denaton's send-off. There was nothing left for them to say. The fans hadn't gotten the message. They were done. They gave us a level editor to make seemingly endless content, and then they dropped a nuke. And fans still wanted a third game in the series. Hotline Miami 2 was an exercise in media literacy, one which many people distinctly failed. While strong in most of the critical areas, its overall vision is so violent, so bloody, and so hopeless, I simply cannot recommend it to anyone, myself included. Hotline Miami fans do a lot of strange things when they feel starved for content. Some of them make video essays about piss, and others create entire custom campaigns for the level editor based on Garfield that are surprisingly well built and fun to play through. Then there's one fan in particular who decided to make a full-blown sequel to Hotline Miami 2. For those blissfully unaware, I'm talking about Midnight Animal, the fan-made pseudo Hotline Miami 3 developed by Spencer Yan. In spite of everything that happened in Hotline Miami 2, fans charged forward with the idea of a third game, official or not. It was scheduled for release in 2016, and after several delays, overhauls, and scandals, it was mercifully cancelled outright in 2019. 
I'm not going to go over the entire situation just for the sake of rehashing it. I feel like there's plenty of other content creators who have covered the Midnight Animal situation to death, but I wanted to bring it up here because I think it proves the point that Denaton were trying to make with Hotline Miami 2. Unfortunately, not much is known about the story of Midnight Animal in its original state, or how much of that version made the cut when the project was turned into a story of love and forgetting, and then reworked again into the exegesis of John the Martyr. Based on what we do know, players were supposed to fill the role of John, a contract killer working for the organization 50 Blessings, which sounds much more in line with what fans would have wanted out of the game. There are several builds floating around online, each from wildly different periods on the development timeline, with some being exceptionally early and brief story sections, still using assets from the original two games, and others being more gameplay-focused slices. The gameplay itself looked like it was bringing some really interesting ideas to the table, with new weapons, the ability to carry reserve ammunition and reload on the go, being able to pick different contracts, etc. I think the presentation had the potential to be a huge step up from Hotline Miami 2 as well. There's weather effects like rain in some of the levels that add to the dark and dreary atmosphere, the screen shake was amplified and made certain weapons feel even more powerful than before when coupled with the further exaggerated gore. Sound effects sounded really crisp and punchy, and the music was more electrifying than ever before while still sounding darker in tone to match the rest of the game. Yes, it changed some of the fundamentals of Hotline Miami's gameplay, but it looked like you'd still be able to play the same way you always have if you wanted to. These new features just expanded your options. You could probably even have a challenge system akin to the custom contracts in Hitman, where certain levels or targets would need to be dealt with in specific ways. There was so much gameplay potential with Midnight Animal, at least in its initial form. When the game took on the moniker of A Story of Love and Forgetting, the standard Hotline Miami style gameplay took a back seat to the JRPG style the project was being overhauled into. It appeared that Spencer had taken some inspiration from the Persona series, and there's nothing inherently wrong with those games. I actually love them, and playing builds of this version was still fun. But to say that the style of gameplay is out of place in a Hotline Miami title would be a gross understatement. After an immense amount of backlash, what was left from a story in Love and Forgetting eventually got turned into the exegesis of John the Martyr. Described as an experimental ergodic text presented in an episodic format about ghosts, loneliness, and the instability of narrative. Only the first chapter of the game is available to download, and I truly did like what I played but it's clear that the game had strayed immeasurably far from the original scope of Midnight Animal. Fans of the series were vocal and cruel, to an unjustifiable degree, even going as far as to send Jan death threats. So before moving on, I feel I should point this out in the interest of not being misconstrued. Do not harass Spencer Jan. We are all human, we all make mistakes, and he deserves the chance to learn from them and grow just like the rest of us. If we were all judged exclusively on our failed projects, I could be buried under the dozens of half-written scripts sitting on my desktop. Just because his work evolved out of the Hotline Miami mold does not necessarily mean that his games aren't high quality. They just aren't Hotline Miami games. I've been following him as a developer since watching the Midnight Animal announcement trailer years ago, and I'm excited to see what he does in the future. His new game is titled My Work Is Not Yet Done, and what's been shown off so far looks incredible. There's a demo available so you can try it out for yourself, and I think it has some amazing potential, so please go check it out on Steam and support him in his endeavors. With that being said, the existence of Midnight Animal at all is evidence enough that fans continually misunderstood Hotline Miami. I don't mind a surprise ending, but rather than enhancing things, the climactic revelation cancels out everything previously seen. In fact, the bitter end is a hypocritical cop-out. You might be wondering how a pixelated, top-down shooter indie game has anything to do with the 1999 movie Fight Club. So let me just say this. If you go check out my channel bio on here, which you should go do, and also subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new videos while you're at it, I say that I make videos about games and occasionally other things. Well, here is the occasional other thing. I love this movie, I love the book that it's based on, and I love the author that wrote it. In writing for this video, I reread Fight Club, watched the movie again, and even read the author's book, Consider This. 
In doing so, I thought there was a really interesting narrative through line between the story of the first Fight Club and Hotline Miami as a series. On a surface level, you have an unreliable narrator who has an alter ego or split personality, Jacket and Tyler Durden, whose actions result in the creation of a group of fans or followers, those being the fans and Project Mayhem, that misinterpret things to the point where the situation is completely out of control, beyond that of even the original creators i.e. Midnight Animal, the final mission with the fans in Hotline Miami 2, and the ending scene of Fight Club. Hotline Miami 2 is even presented to the player in the form of a movie on VHS, with appropriately designed visual motifs for pausing the game, restarting the level after dying, and fast-forwarding or rewinding to different parts of the story. What Denaton achieved with the in-game movie of Midnight Animal and Martin Brown could even be seen as a microcosm of what they achieved with the whole of Hotline Miami 2, reframing that entire game as yet another movie for the viewer to misinterpret. But beyond those similarities, these pieces of media also share a very similar writing style. In Consider This, Chuck Palahniuk discusses ideas like minimalism, especially in dialogue, and the concept of dangerous writing. And just to point this out, it's not exclusively his style, but Fight Club is one of my favorite examples of this type of writing. As far as minimalism and dialogue goes, Hotline Miami absolutely practices that. Jacket is a silent protagonist, and as a byproduct, the dialogue needs to be minimalist, but effective in both the length of what's written as well as in the content itself. And it hits the nail on the head. But what is dangerous writing? Dangerous writing is essentially writing about subjects that scare, embarrass, unsettle, or could otherwise be seen as too taboo to explore or express in the mainstream of your art form. Think graphic depictions, whether that be graphic violence, graphic sexual content, etc. It's not writing about these things just for the sake of writing about them. There's something to be said and the author writes about it until there's nothing left to say, regardless of how uncomfortable it makes them or the audience. Hotline Miami is a perfect example of what dangerous writing looks like in video game form. Look at the countless articles decrying the series for being grotesque for no reason other than shock value, or the hastily written columns about the supposedly vapid depiction of sexual violence in the second game. Hotline Miami writes about many topics that are often satirized into oblivion or barely touched on at all because they make people uncomfortable. War, PTSD, the dangers of idolization, nationalist extremism, assault, sociopathy, etc. And I want to be clear, I'm not praising Hotline Miami because it writes about these things. I'm praising it because it's written well, and happens to use a style of writing that gives it the breathing room to explore these topics. Polinick once said, Do not write to be liked. Write to be remembered. And I wholeheartedly believe that the Hotline Miami franchise was written to be remembered. But if none of that is enough to convince you of the similarities between these two pieces of media, here's one last thing. The reviews I've been showing you throughout the video aren't even reviews of Hotline Miami. They're not reviews of either game in the series nor from posts about Midnight Animal. They're all excerpts from reviews of Fight Club. And yet they mirror much of the discourse surrounding these games. Whether from a standpoint of loving or hating these franchises, there are people on both sides. Those who believe that Hotline Miami is nothing but a bloody, hopeless, humorless bone cruncher that has almost nothing to say and commodifies brutality in the process. Or there are the people who would look at Tyler Durden and think, man, that guy's awesome, we should all try to be more like him. And both kinds of people couldn't be more wrong. Neither of those were ever the messages trying to be conveyed by the original creators. The Hotline Miami saga, much like Fight Club, stands as a testament to how misinterpretations and going to extremes can only hurt people in the long run. And in making that statement, it asks the viewer, do you like hurting other people? But what do you do when your story has been so severely misunderstood that people begin to answer yes, when the fans are out of control? When there is nothing left to say? What do you do? You blow it all up. And when the dust settles, maybe they'll finally see. Hotline Miami 3 doesn't exist. Maybe that's the point.